Hello and welcome to another episode of the Small Gold Subscriber Sound Off. Today I have with me a returning guest, Steve St. Angelo of SRS Rocco Report. Steve, welcome back. How are you doing? Doing great, Lewis. Uh, we've got some interesting things going on in the market, especially the silver market. So I think there's plenty to talk about. Well, I agree. And I think I'd like to start out with silver. There's a lot of interesting things going on in the silver market, not just to us because we follow the silver market daily for over a decade, but there are some unique anomalies there. I guess that's what that means. There's some anomalies, good anomalies in the silver market. Perhaps you want to kick it off and tell me what you're seeing in the silver market that appears to be a bit different and maybe an auspicious sign for price moves in the weeks and months ahead well i i was following the slv and uh we don't know if all the metals in the slv a lot of metals moved in there but if you look at the slv chart uh usually volume of trading is a good indicator uh if the price is moving up and you see a lot of volume that's that's uh, a good indicator that we're, we're starting to see a base of possible big moves ahead and when, when the silver price moved up in the beginning of 2016, it hit a low in uh, 2016, like 14. And then within like six or seven months, it shot up all the way to 21. Well, if you look at the SLV during the monthly trading during those uh, when the SLV was shooting up, let's say, I think in April, the SLV went up three dollars that month. Well, the volume was 237 million. And in June, in 2016, it shot up like two and a half dollars. And the, the volume that month was 238 million. And then in July, when the SLV peaked, uh, it went up another dollar and the volume almost hit 300 million. Now, what's interesting in 2019, in July, when silver and the SLV, it, it only went up a dollar fifty. The volume for July was 400 million shares. And now in, in 2000, I mean, I'm sorry, in August of 2019, the price has gone up in the SLV a little more than a dollar. But we're already in August at 306 million shares. And Lewis, there's still two weeks left in the month of trading. So we could easily see over 500 million shares traded, especially if the silver price continues to increase. Mm -hmm. So. I, I do think there we're starting to see a lot more volume and you've got to go back all the way to 2012 or 2011 to see that type of volume. Right now, Steve, you sent me this chart from Stark Charts. We have it up on the screen for our, our listeners. And what you're talking about are those black candles on the bottom line where you can see them. That shows the net um, buying positions. And you have to go all the way back to, especially if we get over 500, how far back do you have to go to see this type of volume since we've already passed the volume of 2016 when we saw a significant price move from 14 all the way up to 20 or so. Uh, how far back do we have to go on this chart to see this type of volume in the SLV? Well, it looks like if you look at 2012, maybe January, February, but especially back in 2011 in October. And so I think in October in 2011, it reached right at 500 million. But uh, it's so you've got to go back all the way to 2012. So I, I it, it is interesting. And if you even go back further and look when silver really shot up in the SLV, and that was from uh, July 2010 all the way to the beginning, or let's say I think May or April of 2011, when silver went all the way up to 50, you could see the volume in 2010 really pick up. Well, it's we're, we're kind of seeing a similar kind of trend. Now we don't know where the price is gonna go, but when you see that kind of volume, usually a good price, uh, the price movement we, you could you could see much higher price movement with that much kind of volume. But it looks like to me, and I've this is one of my general theories on price movements, is volume generally precedes a sharp movement higher. And if you look at that 2010 in October, it was starting to move, but it did not get its parabolic move until a couple of months later. You can see right. on the chart to the left, you have that big price, that big volume spike, and and a corresponding increase from about. 17 to 21 22 but then it went from 22 to 50. that's right so you do have and a big a big increase in volume 
Yeah, the volume was uh, in, I think, when it peaked, it looks like in April of 2011, it was uh, 1.6 billion. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so we, what's interesting, I don't see that really in, in, in gold, but it, it's it's more in silver. And uh, I think you had mentioned that we're you're also seeing that with the silver ETF, the, the, the metal moving into the silver ETF. Is that correct? And, you know, Steve, I'm seeing almost identical a trend in 2010 the amount of silver in all the silver etfs back then you really had just uh it looks like zkb slv and the sprot sprot wasn't even around in 2010 and in 2010 we saw also a big increase in silver in etfs from about four and a quarter to about 525 before 2011 a huge run-up in the volume of inflows into silver ETFs without any real, the price was moving up. But the but again, the parabolic is, we're looking on the chart now, you can see finally where the black line of price bursts ahead of the rate of increase of silver into the ETFs. Now, what we're seeing in 2019 to the far right of the chart is an even more vertical increase in the amount of silver in the ETFs going from about 590 about 6 million ounces about 6 weeks ago up to about 670 million ounces a very dramatic increase in the volume of silver going into ETFs but but a pretty tepid rise so far in the price of silver now very neat analogy you can say Back in 2010, we saw volume preceding a parabolic price increase. We saw flows into the ETFs preceding a parabolic price increase. If everything was just a neat and happy world, well, that's what we're seeing today. Does it mean that that's what we're going to see? No, but it's better we're seeing that than, than something else. I and mean, we are seeing the rush to stockpile at least paper silver contracts. And let's take a look now at the COMEX. I believe you have some views on what's happening. Well, that's not paper silver contract. That's just actual a paper claim or not even a real claim on physical silver. You own some ownership interest in some mythical pile of silver in the SLV. You'll never get your hands on it. But there has been a big increase in the trading volume of those um, investment vehicles and the amount of silver supposedly flowing into them. But let's take a look at the COMEX. We're seeing also an increase in contracts. You want to take us through that? Yeah, and when you look at the COT report, and we have to realize that the COMEX is a smaller uh, trading volume than the LBMA. But still, what we've seen over the past umpteen years is that when the silver price or gold price increases, then the commercial net short position increases as well. And when the silver or gold price peaks, the the so does the com uh, commercial net short position. And as the gold and silver price correct lower, then we see the commercials uh, liquidating and then the reduction of the net short position. So what was interesting, and I spoke about this in, an, in a prior video that I thought in gold, more in gold that when the price of gold would continue higher due to the fundamentals, we would see a consolidation. And as the price moved higher, then you would see a lot more liquidation in the uh, uh, commercial short positions. So it would it would tend to continue to go lower and lower the commercial net short position. It would consolidate as the gold price went up. But we're not seeing that in gold. As gold goes up, we're seeing the net short position increase. However, with silver, this is what's interesting. It peaked two weeks ago. I believe it was at the end of uh, uh, July 30th. The net short position was like, I think almost 84,000 right. contracts. For those of you watching on the chart, that is the blue line uh, below the line in the third box down. And it gets to about just shy, a little, little over 80,000. Yeah, and according to my math, it was like 83,000. 83,000, okay. Yeah, so, and, and that's when the price of silver, and they, they end the week of the COT report on Tuesday. And the silver price was 1655. That's where it closed on Tuesday. Now, it's it's gone up, but it's corrected. But the net result, if we look at uh, August 13th, there's only about 65,000 net short 
position. So we've had a, a liquidation of about 16,000, 17,000 net short positions. And the price of silver closed on this last Tuesday at almost $17. So you had almost a 45, 50 cent net increase in the silver price in the last two weeks, but the commercial short positions have liquidated. So that that is a quite another interesting dynamic in the silver market. I would, I would thought we would have seen at least an even or a little bit higher net short position. Mm. And we're also seeing, again, the volume is very robust on the COMEX in, in terms of volume. So to me, it seems like there's a lot of interest in investment trading silver. Now, we're not seeing that in the retail side as of yet. If you remember back in 2010 and 11, we did not, we saw increases clearly and I like to use the American Silver Eagles as the benchmark for retail demand in the US, we never used to have a lot of American Silver Eagle demand compared to American Gold Eagle demand. If you look at a chart, I don't have it in front of me right now, but from 1986 to about 2007, the Silver Eagles were an afterthought. The dollar value was very low, and in some instances, the gold sales, the Gold Eagles to American Eagles were two to one, five to one, 10 to one, which is a big deal because gold is much more expensive. But then after the price of silver peaked in 2011, silver sales really shot up because when the financial crisis hit in 2008, there was an increase in silver eagle sales, there was an increase in gold eagle sales, but gold eagle sales led. They really were the big winners in terms of sales in 2009, 10 and 11. But after the price peaked in silver, we saw a dramatic increase up to 35, 45, 47 million American Silver Eagles sold, one ounce American Silver Eagles, in 2015. Now, since 2015, really starting in mid-2016, we've seen a dramatic fall off in that type of retail silver buying. What do you think is going to happen? And again, Silver Eagle buying doesn't drive the price. It so far has reacted to market events, and it the real increases in silver sales were not FOMO during that time period. They were more like, hey, this is a smoking bargain. Where do you think the silver retail, since you have, don't you have a connection with a, a bullion dealer? Where do you think the mentality is of the silver retail buyer? Maybe you could talk about that dynamic. Yeah, and, and during our pre-interview, I did mention how the uh, the last time physical silver buying, the public buying physical silver drove the price was in 1983 but we haven't seen that a little bit of warren buffett i think it was that was in 97 99 uh, 99 we saw we saw a little bit of that there but in the last in the last two decades most of the silver uh buying or the the price dynamic has been the paper buying and i it, you know what's interesting i did talk to a few dealers when gold shot up and it went above that 1360 level and it hit 1400 uh, there was a lot of interest now in the gold because it, it broke out of that five-year resistance level. Well, according to the, the precious metal dealers, the uh, their clients were not taking advantage of buying more gold. They were selling gold four mm -hmm. to one. Now, I heard just recently- Did you, did you say four to one? Yeah, they were selling, uh, it, th there was four people selling gold to one person buying from the precious metal dealer. So the precious metal dealers were buying gold back. Right. But- I well, just excuse me, but you, if you look at American Gold Eagle sales this year, they're atrocious. They're even worse I know. than Silver Eagle sales. Now, what's interesting, in just the last week, that's kind of turned around. Now there's four times people buying gold, but it's still not that much. But what of the buying that's going on now, because gold hit that 1500 level and went, I believe it went to 1525, a little bit higher than 1525, where it's at its new resistance level, then we started seeing people buying gold again, a lot more than selling. But again, you're right. Uh, I do think the issue is the paper uh, buying of gold and silver will continue to be the, the driver of the price because 99% of the market invests in the paper assets and that's what you see you know in the stock market and they're buying the gld they're buying the slv they're buying uh this comics lbma 
But I think the issue is when you start seeing serious trouble, if negative rates continue to go even lower, and we do start seeing problems in the global economy, and we start seeing a lot more volatility in the currency markets, at some point in time, and then we'll start to see more buying of physical, but not yet. And the interesting thing is, why did silver and gold sales, physical stop, sales stop over the last few years? And I think a major reason was because Trump was elected. Uh, Trump was elected and people thought a lot of the right wing or the alt media, they were hoping that Trump would make changes. And, and so the fear of the Democrats and, and the continued, uh, let's say, a gun control, uh, that no longer was a problem, an issue. So I think it, it, it freed up a lot of people. They said, well, Trump is going to fix the problems. We don't need to worry about storing food or buying precious metals. And so I think that was a major reason, one of the major reasons why we saw a big decrease in, in that kind of purchasing. And so unfortunately, I think it's going to take much higher gold and silver prices and we're going to need to see some major financial crises for people to start buying a lot more physical gold and silver. That could be right. And, you know, also they say Obama is probably the best gun salesman president yes. that we've, we've had. And I guess they do kind of go together, uh, preppers, um, self-reliance and gold and silver. Um, although, if you read the alternative financial media they don't seem to think that the economy is doing well. Not all of them are enamored with Trump. Many of them are still predicting financial crisis. So I'm surprised, though, that the I, I can understand somewhat of a fall off, but we've seen a dramatic fall off. And it actually started before Trump was even the potential winner because we saw the fall off really in June of 2016. But I do agree there there is something to it. And the question is, if in 2020 Trump loses, I wonder if we would get a huge increase. I think we would because so far the candidates that we're seeing are all very much in favor of ramping up spending for whether it's for health care for everyone, Medicare for all, including Medicare for illegal immigrants. Medicare for all means Medicare for everybody, not just Americans. So I think that would get people alarmed. And if you have the Green New Deal, which they claim, I mean, I, they're not backing away from it. And if one of them gets elected on that, I'm sure the fear in the market will be not necessarily that it'll get passed, but that that mindset exists. All right, let's move. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, no, and I, I'd like to say something about that. Uh, I saw an interesting uh, series on Netflix yesterday. It was called The Last Czars. And it was with uh, the Romanov dynasty in, in Russia. And we all know about, you know, uh, the Tsar Nicholas uh, was abdicated. And then they, the, the Bolsheviks executed the whole family. Yes. The interesting thing was he was uh, in charge of, of the, uh, the Roman Empire for almost 22 years after he became the new Tsar. And he the, the, would... I'm he sorry, the, Ro the Roman Empire or the... I'm so sorry. The Russian Empire. The Russian Empire. Okay. Yeah. Yes. The Russian well, Empire. Well, he's Romanov, so he's the Romanov yeah. Empire. <laughs> yes, okay. that's exactly. So he was in charge of the Russian Empire for 22 years before he was abdicated or he abdicated. Right. The problem is he lived in a bubble. He had he had no idea of what was going on in 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 the, with the people in his country. He had no idea. And so it, it was a shock to him when he found out that the people actually hated him. What is interesting, what is interesting was seeing the same dynamic today with this, this Green New Deal and health care for everybody. The issue is, it's the, people say, where are we going to get the money? It's not the money, Lewis. Where are we going to get the energy? And so there's this, the, these people are in a bubble too. They, they tend to think we're, we have the ability to, to do all this. And we're printing all this money. We're going into debt. Did you see the U.S. public debt? It's gone up, I think, three hundred and twenty billion in the last two weeks. No, it's up to a trillion now. Isn't it just the annual? Uh, well, no, I'm saying they, the the, uh, the actual debt limit had stopped, but now it's increased. It, it, it's they, it's been increasing for the last last two weeks, or according to uh, a debt to the penny, uh, the U.S. Treasury uh, uh, website. So. 
that's the problem. We they have this idea of providing all this stuff, but they live in a bubble. I mean, a lot of people live in a bubble, but that that's the problem. And so I think the issue going forward, as I've spoken about many times, the, the issue is the energy. It's not the money. If you don't have the energy, you can't have the money and the economic growth. And these people live in a bubble and they try to say all these things, but there really isn't the ability to provide it in the future. I agree with that. Well, let's shift over now to the economy. We were talking about the idea there might be a recession, and we're also, a lot of people are focusing on, and rightly so, the negative yielding debt, which has exploded, and it's up now globally to $17 trillion. In fact, I think it's like one in four newly issued debt securities are negative yielding. What do you make of that? What, what impact is that going to have on the economy? Well, that's you know, that's a good question, and I think the I mean, how much has the negative debt increased in just the last few months? I think it was it was like 14 twelve. 15, yeah, yeah, fourteen, was, twelve. Well, four fifteen in June, and it was like twelve earlier on. That's right. In in just a couple of months, it's gone up five trillion. And, and so, and I, this all gets back to the energy, but. The problem is there's so much debt, as we all know, that there's so much debt in the world that we they can't finance this debt. And unfortunately, we don't have the good quality energy to, to drive economic activity to pay the interest on all this debt. So what's going to happen? The, the situation is we're going to go even into more negative interest rates. And so how does that impact the economy? Well, you know, we've never been really in negative interest rates this this much and what happens if it goes even lower uh, and I I do believe this is going to be where gold becomes a lot more interesting to people because gold doesn't generate a, an interest or uh, a yield but it's better than losing money and I think we, we, we talked about this in the pre-interview that because of there's so many negative interest bonds and debt in the world people are starting to move investors are starting to move into the u.s treasury now that's paying at least right. the interest and i think that's driving the uh u.s treasury interest rate lower as well yeah because it gets attractive people bid them up and then the yield goes down there's that inverse relationship oh well, the other thing about um negative interest rates though it does alleviate the issue you were talking about is having to service the debt because you don't have to service anything negative interest rates you get paid so i think that's perhaps one of the um i wouldn't say silver linings i think it's almost orchestrated this way and the question really is is how much will investors institutional investors the ones who buy this stuff actually put up with this i mean they're supposed to get a return for their investors and we it's not like we have negative inflation it's not like we have deflation we have a positive rate of inflation it's at least two percent by the way they calculate it if you're not going to get a return on your money i would think you might be better off just maybe putting your money into gold and paying your insurance and your and your um storage fees and ditto for silver yeah and i think that's the issue especially if interest rates continue to go lower and, and, and continue to go into deeper negative territory as we think the ecb might right and then of course the united states uh, and what is the the typical economist uh playbook when you hit a recession is you lower interest rates right. uh, 500 basis points five to 600 i mean we did that you know the fed did that uh 10 years ago 12 years ago uh and so if you have to lower the interest rates and you're at 2%, two and a half percent or two and a quarter, then you're, you're seriously in negative. You're in two, two and a half percent. We've never been there before. I, I don't think anybody understands what that looks like, but you have to, you have to understand if you've got a hundred million and you're paying two and a half percent, it's two and a half million that you've got to pay out. It, it's much better to own gold and pay a lot less than two and a half million a year in, in uh, either storage fees or insurance. And then, and that's what happens if interest rates go lower. So, you know, Lewis, this is a very interesting dynamic and I, I don't think it ends well because I don't see how far they can, can push interest rates and I don't know how much it's going to help the economy. 
Well, no, I, I think they're at the point now, I think instead of helping the economy, they're looking to help their balance sheets because, as I mentioned, debt service is a big deal, right? I mean, if you keep... Right now, what will happen is as you roll over debt, instead of owing money, you get paid. And I think that's the main reason they're doing it because I think we've all said that debt is unsustainable, right? I mean, it's just you can't 19 trillion, 100 trillion, whatever, whatever number, whatever particular country has, it, at some point people are saying, well, that's not a problem because you just roll it over. But the debt service becomes unmanageable. There's no way any of the debt's going to get paid. Not, not no way any, no way all of the debt that's outstanding right now in the world can get paid back because it's, it's multiples times the GDP, it's multiple times the, the economic productivity, but the interest payments are going to get to that point. And I think that's really what's driving this uh, negative interest rate environment. And it's amazing that the Fed was able to even raise rates as, as far as they did. But I think that's over now. Wouldn't you agree that we're now no longer in a uh, tightening cycle? I mean, what did Powell say? Powell said that... Um, we are, this is just a pause within the tightening cycle, something to the effect that this isn't the beginning of a uh, series of rate reductions. I think that's famous last words. What do you think? Yeah, and I, you see, the issue, the issue is the economy is rolling over. And you look at uh, semi-truck sales, you, you, just, you did the indicators. And I mean, the U.S. unemployment rate is at is at three point eight or three point nine. Now it, it, it is it is kind of fabricated. They they've changed what the unemployment rate means than it was 20, 30 years ago. But the unemployment rate doesn't stay at a three point eight percent for long. It just it just it doesn't. And so at some point in time when it hits a low, we're at the we're at the top of the cycle, and the stock market. It hit twenty seven thousand plus. It, it hit a high. Now, can it continue higher? It can. Could the unemployment rate go a little bit lower? Sure, it could. But at some at some point in time, these cycles tend to reverse. And so, I think the issue is at some point at some point in time, the Fed will have to continue lower interest rates, especially now that we're seeing interest rates becoming even more negative or larger amount becoming more negative going forward. And I, I, I do think the Fed and Trump are going to have a, a it's going to be a, a, a fist fight going forward. <laughs> but I, I do believe they're going to have to lower interest rates. I, I do. I do think the next meeting they will have to lower interest rates because look at the stock market. The stock market has been seriously volatile and we're, we're seeing some evidence that you know, come September, October, there could be another big uh, another big decline in the market. Well, I think what's going on is there is a limit. I, li I like to look at things this way. There is a limit to how high a stock market can go. Even with you don't care about earnings, you don't care about sales, there is a limit. Um, there's also a limit to the dollar being a safe haven. Now, for better or for worse, the dollar and the yen are considered for different purposes, safe havens. People like to use the yen as a carry trade. People like the dollar. They think they can hold on to it in the form of treasuries. They think they're going to win that way. But there is a limit to the dollar as a safe haven. What do I mean by that? Well, the dollar index can't go to 200. Because if the dollar index went to 200, that would destroy the U. It would destroy the global economy because most... Emerging markets, including China, run on dollars. It would make dollars too expensive. The United States would not like that. It would destroy exports. Um, you cannot have a $200, um, what's the word? A $200, a $200 index. Right now, it's almost 100. I think right now it is at uh, 98.20. 98 but there's nothing stopping gold from going from 1500 to 2500 I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying there's no, there's nothing stopping that when go when they finally have to cap the dollar's rise. Well, where's that money going to go for safe haven? And when you also consider, uh, according to uh, Savalas research, that global conventional assets are about four hundred and sixty-nine trillion, and this was as of 
this is a year ago, it's probably higher now, but about 469 trillion were in real estate, securitized debt, and stock market, as well as gold and silver. Now, how much did gold and silver investment account for that total? Three trillion. Yeah, and how so, much of it was silver, even by? Uh, 50 billion. <laughs> right. So it's like silver didn't even, wasn't even a rounding error. Uh, right. Most of it's, yeah, and that's that that's including all central bank gold and, and all private. So it, it's about three trillion. Uh, and I'm not including all the jewelry and all that, but investment gold in the world is only three trillion. That's it. So when you compare, if you start doing math, three trillion divided by 469 trillion, it's not even 1%. Right. So I, I think the issue is when rates become even more negative, everybody can't move into the treasury. And well, that's so, my I, point. That, that's the point. And not everyone can just get dollars and boost the dollar higher because the, the United States will take action to lower the, the value of the dollar. Or they'll just, they'll just flood the market with more treasuries if that demand is there. So I think, in, I think uh, mainstream investors are now starting to get precious metal religion. Uh, they're just they're just getting a hint of it. And we're seeing that in the volume and the SOV. We're seeing that in, in the way the gold price has been trading. I mean, even though the gold is 50, it hit fifteen twenty fifteen hundred twenty five dollars in U.S. dollars. You know, there was one chart that shows that it's a high and it's reached an all time high in 73 different currencies. Yes. It, it's a new high in Australia. It's a new high in the um, Canadian. In the, and so. The U.S. dollar has the monopoly on the printing press, and so we get a little bit more of a reprieve. But at some point in time, I do think when the light bulb goes off in the mainstream investor, which holds 99% of the assets in the world, you don't need much of them to move into gold right. where you could see a $2,500 gold increase, 1% of that, a 1% switch out of some of those assets and into gold and silver, you could see much higher prices. Well, so easy. what you're saying, uh, I, should, I don't have the charts updated, but I had charts for Australia, Canadian dollar, Russia, all the different um, foreign currencies where gold has surpassed its 2011 high, British pounds, euros, um, has not yet done so in the dollar. And part of that is because the dollar is still considered the strongest currency in the world and there's still that movement towards the dollar i think once if we get close to the all-time high in the dollar with gold that'll be the next resistance point i think if you get to 1900 dollars, it'll quickly blow through that number because as i said there is a point where the dollar can only be so strong and it'd be a favorable outlook for the world and the united states whereas so what if gold goes to $2,500? It's not like in the old days when gold was tied to the dollar and tied to all the foreign currencies when we had the classical gold standard or when we had the, the dollar standard under Bretton Woods where the price of gold had to be corralled, had to maintain that $35 peg. It really doesn't now. Um, and given the size of the market, it's no longer, as you say, it's not like it's 10% of the market of investable... You can see just all it has to do, like you say, if you get 1% to 2% of investable money flowing into gold, and then you're going to get some spillover into silver because silver is, you know, it's the cheaper cousin, the smaller, the little brother of gold in some respects. It has some monetary component, some investment component. It picks up some of that, that could rise as well. So if this current dynamic continues with negative rates and a rising dollar, the dollar has to cap out at a certain point, and at what point, where do you go? Well, you can rush into treasuries, you can drive them down to zero. Then where do you go? At some point, if you're going to have inflation, even nominal inflation, you're going to want something that does better than make you pay to store your money. That's correct, and I'm, I'm looking at a chart of gold in the euro. And even though it spiked back in September, like everything else, the it's the the top has been about fourteen hundred in the in the euro. That's where the gold. Do you know it reached thirteen ninety four this month? 
Yep. In the year, so it, once I once it goes above that fourteen hundred level in the in the European Union in the in the euro, I think we could see another big breakout. It it could go easily to fourteen fifty to fifteen uh, fifteen hundred dollars. So, it, yeah, we're starting to see this this dynamic now. And you know, before years ago, you could say, well, it didn't take much to go into gold and silver, but back then. People could go into the stock market, and we've seen that. I mean, I, I made fun of this thing called Beyond Meat. It went from twenty-five dollars to two hundred and forty in three months. So there's there's been a lot of speculation, a lot of insanity going on in the stock market. There's but a now, limit to that. There's a limit to that because I and now when you start to get into negative interest rates, and you start seeing the volatility in these currency markets. You know, mainstream investors who have been a little bit, uh, let's say, ignorant to gold and silver, they're starting to wake up to it now. And, and so you don't need much of right. an increase. You really you really don't. Well, it's I, also, you know, if you just show somebody, an investment advisor shows you what the carrying cost of gold is to put it either into GLD or to purchase and store and insure, it's less than and you're going to get a price appreciation. You're not going to get that on your bond. So it almost becomes, to use a cliche, a no-brainer. And then if you want to speculate, because silver doesn't have the same stability, but it does have a bigger upside, then you could see how people would uh, could make some silver, substantial silver bets as well. Yeah, and I do believe that gold will reach new highs, but I do I do see silver outperforming gold on, on a percentage basis. Uh, so... To me, silver is kind of the underdog. And what is also interesting, I did the information, I did the research on it. Out of all the silver and gold in the world, investment gold and silver, they're about one to one. There's yes. about two and a half billion ounces of gold. There's about two and a half billion ounces of silver, all silver. I'm talking, right. there's a lot of silver held in custodian accounts. Uh, that isn't, that you don't see in the, in the comics or the silver ETFs. But still, that, there's only about one to one. Right. And the uh, reason for that is, it's very simple, there isn't the demand currently for investment silver because silver is largely an industrial commodity, whereas gold has held on to its jewelry slash investment uh, demand profile. But as I've been saying for years, at some point, if that investment demand portion of silver demand gets attention, then there's not that much silver there and it's such a small market. And that's why we've seen the price of silver in 1980 and 2011 really take a dramatic spike because if there is some movement in the silver, it goes higher. The problem we've had, and this is what remains to be seen, if we get another spike in silver, will we see a corresponding dive? And I don't know. I, I would think if it spiked again, maybe it, people might look at it and say, this is a keeper. It hasn't been that way in the past, but... You never know, given the fact that silver is not that plentiful. And um, if this is a more longer term, I think what happened in 2011 was a lot of people, besides the manipulation, but a lot of people started to feel more comfortable with what was happening with QE and uh, the the economy. It was probably not well founded to believe that, but uh, there was a sense that things were getting better and they were always talking about the recovery and all that. But if you have a permanent situation, which we didn't have back then, of negative interest rates, then I can see maybe silver holding on to any type of parabolic gains if it becomes, oh, yeah, you know, I can store some some excess capital in silver just as easily I can store it in gold and a few other places. But um, if we have negative yielding bonds at $17 trillion, they keep going up, some of that's money got to come out of there because if you have inflation, investors are not going to go with people, their advisors, parking uh, money in they're going to be yield pigs. They're going to want something. Yeah, and I think I've got an interesting theory on how things will can play out in the future. And it all comes back to the energy. And when the central banks continue to lower interest rates and we see more negative yielding debt, you can't go the other way. We, I mean, the Fed did. The Fed did a little bit, but it didn't. I mean, it went up to 2.5%. Yeah. And, and so the thing is, I, I, I do believe we'll, we'll see a continuation of a decline or a lowering of interest rates and even lower than they are now. Mm -hmm. 
The well, thing clearly, is, clear. If they're thinking they're going to go into a recession, they need the firepower, and they know where to head. Negative. Now, this idea that certain analysts are saying that you know they're going to lose control, if if they lose control, or if interest rates start going the other way, it destroys the whole system. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is we don't have the profitable net energy to allow this system to provide a high interest rate, and so. It, there's no coincidence that the amount of debt in the world has gone up as this energy return on investment of oil has been declining. So it's a kind of, there's an inversion, inverted relationship. And so now when the interest rates go down, it, it's a one-way street. Once that game is over, I do think it's different this time around mm -hmm. because we're not going to we're not going to have ten years of another ten million barrels a day of oil production growth. I don't see that. And, and that has to do with the shale industry. So I do think we're going to run into energy trouble. And if you don't have growing energy production, you don't have grow, growing GDP growth. And you can't. You If you start printing money. That's not going to do more, it. No, you look more like Venezuela. Right, right. All right, Steve. I want to thank you for joining me today. Uh, where can our listeners find you? Well, I have the srsrockreport.com, and I put out two or three articles a week. Uh, I try to focus on the precious metals, the mining industry, the overall economy, and how energy is impacting all that. And that's a very overlooked uh, factor. And I also have the SRS Rock Report YouTube channel. I try to put out at least a couple of videos a month, and I'm getting ready to put a new one out, uh, hopefully today. So that's where they can find me. And I do believe if you continue to focus on the energy, that will give you, that's the canary in the coal mine. All right, Steve, I want to thank you for joining me today. And uh, we look forward to catching up with you real soon, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lewis.